Uh, as, as Scott said, we're here today to commemorate uh, the, uh, the uh, sad anniversary of the Holocaust and the liberation of Auschwitz-Birkenau by the Red Army. On this day, the 27th of January, 1945, that site at Auschwitz has become the symbol of Nazi mass murder of some six million Jews, as well as uncounted other victims of Nazi Germany tyranny. Now, Auschwitz was several things at once. It was a work camp where healthy adults were engaged in slave labor and dehumanized to a degree that has never ceased to horrify those who study it. Auschwitz was also the site of extermination of perhaps one and a half million human beings, people whose names were never registered at the camp, whose, whose time at uh, Auschwitz-Birkenau may be measured in 30 minutes or an hour, maybe two hours, only long enough to be stripped of their clothes and uh, corralled into gas chambers where some 2,000 souls at a time would be murdered then incinerated, their bones crushed, their ashes dumped in ponds. Auschwitz alone, among all the Holocaust sites of mass murder, was neither fully destroyed nor evacuated of prisoners at the time of liberation. In the second half of 1944, as I'm sure some of you know, some 60,000 prisoners at the complex were sent on a forced march further west. You also had, and many of those survived the, uh, the Holocaust, you also had a train in 1943 of French resistance um, uh, prisoners, uh, or including some 200 women, who were sent to Auschwitz by mistake and were subsequently sent on to other camps, for example, the women's prison work in Berlin called Ravensbrück. And then at the moment of liberation, there were 30,000 30, prisoners at the site who were rescued, as you see in this picture, um, uh, with the arrival of the Red Army. Now, 30,000 survivors of the camp may seem like a trivial number when set against the millions that perished during the war. But let me remind you that among those 30,000 were two individuals who have played a key role in the creating a canon of testimonials. I'm referring to Otto Frank, Anne Frank's father, who rescued from obscurity her diary, and also Primo Levi, the Holocaust survivor eyewitness uh, par excellence, who I'll talk a, uh, about uh, more in a moment or two. The unique circumstances of the liberation of Auschwitz come to us now from a distance that stretches the possibilities of memory and of the lifetime of a single individual. Since almost no adults over the age of 35 were permitted to survive their arrival at Auschwitz-Birkenau, Birkenau, and children, of course, were immediately gassed, the surviving witnesses, with only a few exceptions, were always individuals born between 1910 and 1930. Most have already left us, and the few remaining um, will uh, certainly uh, pass on uh, before the end of this decade. Uh, that brings a certain urgency to the question of Holocaust memory, since, as we will see today, it was a unique, unique uh, uh, moment in human history and one where the eyewitnesses performed an outsized role in keeping alive the memory. Walter Benjamin said that historians must speak for the dead, and we wonder sometimes with trepidation, uh, which apprentice historians amongst us today will uh, agree to the responsibility of speaking for those voices that are now trailing off. I'll come back to that thought at the end of the talk, but let us return uh, for a moment to liberation and the deliverance of those 30,000 survivors in place that I mentioned who 
who uh, were uh, rescued from this uh, freezing, abandoned uh, uh, hellscape uh, by, um, by the Red Army. Uh, Red Army soldiers, some of whom arrived on skis. The rest of Poland would be conquered uh, uh, subsequently, and then uh, Germany and Berlin within a few months. Uh, the war ended in, in early May 1945. The war over, it soon became apparent that uh, of Europe's pre-war Jewish population of 9 million, some two thirds had been exterminated. They were shot, burned, buried alive, bludgeoned, crushed, stabbed, drowned, and gassed. Among them were some 1.5 million children, the largest such state-sponsored kill-off of youngsters in history. And yet the survivors on that day that we remember today, 78 years ago, well, they had very few happy memories of liberation, nor of their return home, if indeed they uh, ever made it home. The case of the Jews of Kielce is uh, illustrative. Kielce is a small city in Poland between Warsaw and Krakow. Before the war, a third of the population was Jewish, so about, about 24,000 out of 75,000 uh, people. Of those Jews, about 1% survived, um, a little bit less. And in uh, the summer of 1946, some of those Kielce Jews, about 200, returned home. The rest had been exterminated. Well, Poles looked upon returning Jews with disbelief. Uh, we have lots of evidence of the reactions to the arrival of, of Polish Jews in towns all over the country. Um, the, a common reaction would be, what? The Jews, some of them survived. They're here now. And in Kielce, on a single day in July 1946, a quarter of those returning number were murdered in a day-long pogrom led by Polish civilians, policemen, and soldiers. The Kielce pogrom was evidence that the demise of the Nazi regime, the end of the occupation by Germany of Poland, did not resolve the question of Polish anti-Semitism. But where were the Jews to go? Well, Israel didn't exist yet. Um, there were no countries stepping forward to welcome Pol uh, Jewish refugees. That would happen just a few late, years later. In 1948, the United States started uh, letting them in. Uh, uh, for the moment, they languished in uh, displaced person camp, persons camps, uh, mainly in Western Germany. Italian, Dutch, French Jews returning home, they re-entered a society that had already moved on, where people had problems of their own. Uh, Primo Levi wrote that his sister in Italy paid him little attention when he got back, asking no questions. Um, uh, Marceline Lorian Evans, who I'll talk about a bit later, a French uh, survivor who, was, uh, who arrived at Auschwitz at the age of 15, uh, she said that her mother had just one question for her Were you raped? <clears throat> no one offered counseling. There was no notion at the time of PTSD. If there were to be an event today for this audience, uh, if someone were to be stricken with a heart attack or a stroke, you can be assured that the Linen Hall would offer you all counseling. Uh, but in fact, there, was, there were no such um, uh, uh, offers to the uh, Jews returning home. Apart from indifference, there was um, uh, the fact that many Jews returning home found that they had lost everything. They had lost their uh, families in the war, and they had lost all of their possessions, even the right to live where in apartments where they had uh, previously uh, lived before the deportations. Lucia Heilman, a Viennese Jew, later recounted that even as her family was preparing to be de deported from Vienna in March 1938, the neighbors entered the flat to begin taking things away. 
It was common for a Parisian Jew to return home and find that everything was gone, down to the light fixtures and the flue liner in the, in the chimney. So we might ask ourselves next how the world ever learned the details of what had happened. One intriguing counterfactual, counterfactual scenario in history is whether or not if Germany had won the war, the fate of the Jews would have ever seen the light of day. This is actually the premise for a pretty good thriller by Robert Harris, who you may know, called Fatherland. Um, but it was also alluded to often by the Nazi leadership during the war. Uh, Himmler talked about this several times. Uh, they, they, they mused that in 500 years, there would just be some kind of idea that there were Jews. We didn't know what happened to them. And uh, there, would, there would be no evidence of the crime. Now, the liberation of the camps became a media event. It was photographed and filmed. It created an immediate outbreak of public anger. The American photojournalist Lee Miller she gave voice to this fear when she was uh, uh, photographing Doc Allen Buchenwald for Vogue magazine. Uh, Miller was dismayed to meet local Weimar Germans who professed ignorance of the existence of Buchenwald. And they would tell her, wir haben nicht gewusst. Indeed, and even the most G uh, linguistically uh, challenged GI soon learned that the Ahala Mishkabus means we didn't know. As Miller wrote, weren't these the same Germans who so loved to throw on a backpack and sing songs about wandering and hiking as they explored the neighboring hills? The stench of tens of thousands of unburied corpses at Buchenwald escaped them. The leadership of the victorious allies seized on the liberated camps as evidence of what the war had been fought over and to justify sacrifices. Uh, they ordered newsreel and, and atrocity shorts, which attracted enormous audiences back home, as you see here, and also stoking anger. In London, a feature length documentary was created on German concentration camps, and Hitchcock was flown from Tinseltown to work on editing the film. But with the coming of the Cold War, it was never released. It was shelved, only to be discovered about 15 years ago by the Imperial War Museum. It was decided that what Germany needed in the Cold War, the American, Anglo-American officials did not want to alienate them by reminding them uh, atrocities during the war. Meanwhile, at Nuremberg in 1946, the first post-war trials indicted the Nazi high command only. 22 people. There would be no collective reckoning. Well, you might wonder about the Soviet response. The Soviet ally, of course, in 1945, was occupying the main killing fields of Eastern Europe. Uh, and all of the principal sites of the Holocaust by bullets, that is the era of 1941-1942, before the coming of the extermination camps in, in Poland, uh, where uh, uh, several million Jews already were being shot in mass um, uh, massacres. And um, at that time, while the war raged, ra Range, Stalin authorized the Jewish leadership of the Soviet Union to document the extermination. And these efforts were led by a Ukrainian journalist, a Jewish uh, journalist called uh, Lasley Grossman. And he and his colleagues collectively created something they called the Black Book of Soviet Jewry, which was a thousand page long, meticulous uh, documenting of the mass, uh, mass shootings that occurred across the across Soviet soil under the occupation after Barbarossa. Stalin, at the end of the war, shelled the Black Book. It was repressed. Many of the leading Jews involved were repressed. Some were shot. Um, the, um, the process in the West was much like that in the East. 
Uh, in addition, in the Soviet Union, the policy was always don't divide the dead. That is, the Nazi tyranny brought terror to uncounted millions, including communists and intellectuals and Ukrainians and Belarus and Jews. And uh, the Soviet policy was not to highlight any one nationality over another. So they canceled the Black Book. And on the eve of Stalin's death, he became quite, quite crazy at that moment and full of rage. And uh, another purge of Soviet Jewry was launched just on the eve of his death in 1952, which um, thankfully was averted when he died. Survivors who sought to publish their memoirs in the first years after the war found themselves discouraged. Uh, the Italian Primo Levi, who I mentioned before, who survived Auschwitz, he struggled to find a publisher for his work. And they only agreed to publish it after he created a sanitized version of his book, If This Is a Man, if this, uh, uh, also known as Survival in Auschwitz. He was also told there was no interest in Italy for, for stories of the Holocaust. Italy wanted to move on, move forward, embrace or move on towards the economic miracle of the 1950s. Many others, many others returning home were reluctant to share their experiences. And I would suggest to you two reasons for that. First of all, as the, when the war ended, where so many were killed, if you survived, you were considered lucky. And uh, those who returned to cities that had been under German occupation, they found that the people who had left they had left behind, they had, they had lived through indignities, suffering of their own. So there wasn't an audience for a uh, specific uh, a, a Jewish uh, narrative of what the experiences in the camps in the East had been like. The second reason was that the stories themselves were so traumatic that few survivors wanted to burden their survivor, surviving family or their their descendants with the details. It was too upsetting. The memories were mostly repressed. And indeed, there remain details of the Holocaust that um, are literally unspeakable. Uh, for example, if you watch the nine hour Cloud Lonsman documentary from 1985, Shoah, that I'll talk about more in a moment, buried deep in that documentary is a description of death in the gas chamber. And to my knowledge, it's one of the few attempts to evoke the, the, what went on within the gas chamber. It's um, uh, to, to, uh, to repeat those details. It's, it's very difficult to do without reveling in it. Well, if, if little official recognition was coming, if memories were discouraged, then how do we account for the eventual explosion of interest and the creation of memoirs, the whole canon of literature, and also uh, representations? How do we account for that? The answer is that the will to transmit and to teach the details, the history of the Holocaust was insurmountable. In fact, it was a direct reaction to it, a kind of contradic contradiction to the wartime German policy of denying the extermination, of destroying evidence of the crime. At Auschwitz, there was a sign. It read, Hier gibt's kein Warum. Hier gibt's kein Warum. Don't ask why. There is no why here. And that prescription on inquiry built into the final solution. Well, even at the height of the war, during the extermination, there were Jews, there were also Gentiles who interrogated the crime, who documented the crime, questioned it, sought to inform the world, or leave, leave notes, leave traces, etchings on walls, uh, notes hidden in barracks that together later on historians would use to, to construct a, a meticulous narrative of, of what had happened. And then you also have, you also have transmission uh, uh, around the circle of historians of Emanuel Grindelblum, who was a, an historian who, who at the Warsaw Ghetto created a, an archive of the ghetto, of 
uh, German policy and Jewish <laughs> suffering. And this, this archive ended up including uh, troves of material uh, uh, that documented every aspect of life in the camp. Uh, uh, the, the, the way that people there were fed, how meals were prepared for tens of thousands every day, the homework assignments for children, the way life continued even on the eve of, of uh, deportation, children having to uh, attend their music lessons and, flat, and practice their violins, even though their teachers knew that the following day they would be deported. And these, this archive was hidden in these milk containers in three different places around the Warsaw ghetto. Two were later discovered. A third we still haven't found. For Primo Levy, Levy articulated, I think, as well as anyone else, the, the urge to transmit and to teach and inform. His reference was Coleridge, the rhyme of the ancient mariner. And I don't have to tell any of you that this is a story of a lone survivor of a shipwreck who, who lived through an experience so terrible, and yet one he feels obliged to share. And for Levy, this was the this was his own experience. He identified closely with the ancient mariner. Levy became a kind of professional witness. Uh, he had the gift and he had the calling. Um, but for me, his works of poetry are 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 even um, uh, more more uh, essential. Um, uh, this one is called the Song of the Crow from 1946 not uh, widely disseminated at the time. I'll read it for you. I have come from far off to bring bad news. I flew over the mountain. I flew through the low cloud. My belly was mirrored in the swamp. I have flown without rest for a hundred miles without rest. So as to find your window, so as to find your ear, to bring you the sad news, which will take the joy from your sleep which will spoil your bread and wine, which will sit every evening on your heart. Many survivors discuss their, their testimonies as a pedagogical mission. The French call it a devoir, de mémoire, a duty to, to testify, <clears throat> duty of memory. And uh, Marceline Gloria Evans, she, uh, she recounts how in Auschwitz a dying old woman motioned for her to come forward and the, all she wanted to tell her was, be my messenger, be my messenger. And this, these words are actually, they run through much of the, much of the uh, experience of the pedagogy by the survivors. Jeanette Polinka, I'll show a picture of her in a little while. She she spoke, she speaks in, in, in just these terms when she meets with children in France or takes them to Auschwitz. She says, okay, this that was, I told you my whole experience now, and she's 98 years old. She says, now you have to promise me, you you are going to be my messengers. I'm I, I have I'm going to have to trust you with the, with these uh with these uh, uh true stories of my experience. <clears throat> For, for decades, the key to the transmission were the witnesses and uh, the survivors. Uh, I, and I witnessed the power of their, their um, the power of this transmission firsthand uh, at my first teaching job in St. Louis in 2001. And at that time, they were just one or two phone calls away. It couldn't have been more easy. And the one that I found uh, who was living in St. Louis was a kinder transport survivor called Hetty Epstein. And I called her and she came right in and talked to my class. And um, at the end of the class, uh, I, I was fascinated to see Hetty say to the students, she said, okay, I have a few more minutes if you'd like to come up and ask me anything else in particular. And the students all rushed forward. They got as close to her as they could. Physically, they wanted to touch her. Other survivors talk about how students are drawn to the tattoo. They want to run their fingers along it. They want to feel it. They want to, they want to in some way connect with that pain. Maybe pick up part of that pain. Maybe take it away. Uh, 
The witnesses were key to the transmission. Marceline Laurie Evans, uh, Charlotte Delbo, another key figure, especially useful, I think. Uh, I always recommend Charlotte Delbo to my students. Uh, she was one of these women who was sent to Auschwitz by mistake in uh, January 1943, the group of French women resistors. She lived there for a year and then she was sent off to Ravensburg. But uh, Charlotte Delbo is a critical figure in all this because she's not Jewish. And for my students, I often find that the experience of the Holocaust is often one that is, that is, that is very exclusive. And it's because of many of the survivors presented it that way. As a, it's a uniquely Jewish experience. And, and you feel as if you're outside of that, that circle. And Charlotte Delbo, because she wasn't Jewish, but she shared that experience, she was able to say, no, this is, this is not uh, 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 this is not uniquely Jewish. And even if you're not Jewish, you can, you can share in the, in the grief of, of what it means to be a human being and, and, and coexist with, with this uh, collective experience. Marceline Lurie Dunneven just died a few years ago. She's also a very important witness that I would recommend to you. Because she arrived in Auschwitz as a 15-year-old girl. Um, I think of her uh, account as somewhat of a, like a continuation of Anne Frank's story, since Anne Frank died at that age and never was able to uh, bear witness to her experience at, at, at Auschwitz. And, uh, but, um, uh, Marceline Laurie Don Evans is someone you may wish to explore. And what I found most striking uh, in, in her in her works, she was asked once if there was anything at Auschwitz that she longed for. Is there anything she missed being at the camp? And she responded, the only thing I missed from Auschwitz was the feeling of being loved. Because in that milieu of dehumanization, any gesture, any gesture of solidarity or camaraderie or tenderness was so treasured that uh, you would later have nostalgic feelings for it. <clears throat> you have the witnesses, you have the memoirs, you have the creation of the canon, and you also have history. Historians became interested in this. 1960s and 1970s, and it, it mirrored other other uh, developments in in, his, in historiography more general. It it it, it uh, came into its own alongside African American studies and women's studies. Look the uh, look at history from below, minority history, victim histories, uh, histories of the South, and um, in this way, uh, uh, an academic field was born, but one that intersected many other histories. So it's it's the history of anti-Semitism of Poland, of the national histories of Germany. It's also the history of the United States. It's the history of the book, of art, of soci it's sociology, it's psychology, it's, it's uh, uh, science, and pseudoscience, and medicine, and also, as we'll see near the end, archaeology. After Auschwitz, Adorno said there could be no poetry. We've all heard this quotation, and he regretted saying um, uh, uh, that Auschwitz had somehow neget negated uh, future forms of human creativity or expression. Uh, in fact, his initial reaction was shared by many, but it became a cliche, and then it was simply not borne out by what followed, a remarkable plurality of representations, uh, including poetry, as I just read the poem by, the 19th verses poem by Primo Levi. Adorno should have remembered Dante. What did Dante say? Um, Dante uh, mused that paradise could not be uh, written about, that you could not, you could not represent paradise. But you can represent hell. Part of the point of this that hell can be hell can be described, <clears throat> and um, and for me, some of the most uh, successful writing of the Holocaust is that which doesn't attempt to be forensic or factual. Like, for example, like Primo Levi, um, Levi observes Auschwitz with a kind of 
striking and detachment, devoid of sentimentality or self pity. A different model might be the one that I just mentioned, um, uh, Charlotte Delbo or Marcelino Morgan and Evans. Um, let me talk a little bit about other forms of representation uh, on the screen. Now, these, um, these are probably better known to us than, than, than anything else. The, the, the biggest TV event of my childhood, and probably that for some of you as well, was the 1978 miniseries called Holocaust. It was shown on NBC across five nights, and it attracted some 60 million um, uh, viewers. It's the second most watched program in, in American television history. Uh, you don't want to first. It'll depress you no end. I'm sure you can imagine what it was, Brian, because you lived through this too. <clears throat> this is the TV event that brought the term Holocaust into common usage. Before this event, a lot of Americans thought the Holocaust referred to a Jewish holiday. The series, well, what can we say about it? The first two parts were pretty good. I mean, the first two parts deal with the, the uh, a German Jewish family, and we see how incredulous they are as successive measures, anti-Semitic measures are introduced against them that gradually deprive them of uh, much of their, their, their civil rights, their legal rights, their humanity. Uh, and these are all introduced piecemeal. We, we see this in the series of how these measures are, are introduced one at a time. You hear about them or you see them posted on, on, uh, on walls. Jews do not leave their homes after 8 p.m. Jews do not make telephone calls. The next day, Jews could not listen to the radio. Jews could not legally enter swimming pools or cinemas or theaters. They couldn't go to concerts. They couldn't go to railway, railway stations. They couldn't board trolleys. They couldn't walk on sidewalks. They couldn't go to restaurants. They could not possess a car, a bicycle, or a driver's license. They couldn't buy the following items. Chocolate, fruit, newspapers, or flowers. They couldn't own a sofa or a caged bird. Well, when the series shifted to the camps, but that's when you have problems. <clears throat> and there are problems that still plague representation on the screen of the event. Uh, for, for example, um, uh, on American Network Television in the 1970s, no nudity was permitted on the screen. You couldn't have any actors nude. Well, the basic part of the Holocaust and the experience of Auschwitz was to strip prisoners. I mean, Marceline Laurie Dan even talks about this. She said that when she was being registered at the camp, and that she, she came like all of them from a very modest Jewish upbringing, an interwar Jewish upbringing. She had never seen her mother make. And here she is with 200, 200, 200 other women um, uh, naked and being shaved. Being shaved from head to toe. None of this could be depicted uh, on the television. So without the forced collective nudity, you're missing an elemental part of the dehumanization. That was one problem. The other problem was that the actors looked healthy. They were healthy. They were fed between takes as required by the Screen, screen Actors Guild. They were not skeletons. Mm -hmm. So it was um, fairly unbelievable. Nonetheless, it had a profound uh, impact on the uh, emerging collective sense of the, the Holocaust. I mean, it played the following year in, in Europe, in France, and in Germany. In Germany, there was a cynical joke that, that, that followed the, the the showing of the series on television, that the, the, the miniseries had a bigger impact than the original. I would draw your attention to two representations that I often recommend to people. First is the 1971 Herald and Maud, which you probably all saw, uh, except for my student there in the back, but judging by the age of many of the uh, audience, you probably all saw this in the 1970s. You may not even recall this as being a Holocaust film, but it's about an Auschwitz survivor and her, the last week of her life where she is on a kind of uh, 
enjoy ride, enjoy the ride, uh, stealing cars, um, uh, seducing a younger man, and it's a it's a it's a poignant uh, uh, representation of uh, the the life of a woman at the end of her life, reflecting on on uh, her experience. And the other film I already mentioned, Show Up, nine and a half hours, and uh, uh, still, even though it came out in 1985, the, the sine qua non of of, um, of Holocaust uh, films. Show was released in 1985. Uh, uh, at the moment of the 40th anniversary of the end of the war. And it, it nearly went unnoticed among all the uh, commemorations in Europe at that time. More important was the year 1989. 1989, the fall of the Berlin Wall, a critical year in the in moving forward you know, collective sense of the Holocaust. The fall of the Berlin Wall, well, Jewish tradition suggests that the future is built on what is destroyed. Think of Moses and the tablets, think of the, the happy Jewish couple smashing a glass when they get married. And uh, looking back, we understand that the demise of the Berlin Wall was a kind of a, a, a breakthrough as the Soviet Union soon disappeared. And the archives in the East were opened up also, the sites of extermination were now readily available for visits or explorations or research. Uh, so you had a number of things happening at all once, which led to the flourishing of the field with you know, key critical works then emerging. Uh, Gold Hagen's Hitler's Willingness, Executioner's Christopher Brown's Ordinary Man. And then in 1993, the first Holocaust Museum opened in Washington, of all places, 1993. 19, the 1990s were a decade of consensus in Holocaust memory. You had the US Holocaust Memorial Museum that, that become the new center of gravity and suggests what we might call an Americanization of the Holocaust. And this was confirmed by the 1993 runaway blockbuster hit Schindler's List, which was a, a landmark cultural event that created a digestible, cathartic version of Auschwitz, seen through the eyes of a good German. The film also altered the memory universe of the Holocaust because the proceeds of the film went to create a foundation that collected survivor testimonies. How would that have happened without the film? It meant that the survivors who were dying out in the 1990s, they were able to respond to an appeal, and it was very efficient. If you responded, they sent a team to your door, they recorded the interview, and these interviews are today available for, for all of us to study. They're easily accessed. Now, Schindler's List, in looking back today, so uh, 30 years ago, it appears as the perfect expression of post-1989 consensus. That is, after all these false starts, creating a collective sense of the meaning of, of the Holocaust, we, we finally have it all coalescing around a story with a happy ending, and how uplifting it was, as we all know, to see this black and white film suddenly turn to color and there we have Jews in Israel paying their tributes to this good German industrialist, this selfless man. But the, the Holocaust zeitgeist of the 1990s was equally marked by a classical music phenomenon. Heinrich Goretzky's Third Symphony, the Symphony of Sorrowful Songs. It was a music sensation that anyone alive at the time will remember. But like the movie I just mentioned, also from 1993, this recording, you see the album cover here, which topped both the classical and the pop charts in that year, 1993 and 1994. Uh, it was presented constantly as a meditation on the memory of the Holocaust. It was presented as a soothing soundtrack to the Holocaust. 
Believe me when I tell you, it was nothing of the sort. The symphony depicted three separate moments in Polish history that had nothing to do with Jews, nothing to do with Auschwitz. We only wanted it to. It wasn't about extermination. In fact, the euphonic, melodious, tonal sound world of the Gretzky Third Symphony is so far removed from the cacophony of the camp that it boggles the mind. The concentration camp was never silent. It was a terribly noisy place. You had dogs barking incessantly. You had capos screaming orders at the Jews. You had the SS shouting their rage and anger. And you had the sound of Jews wailing in grief and dying. How quaint to think that 30 years ago, Holocaust memory is set to a soundtrack of undulating A major chords. Well, the pleasant major key finale of Yurensky's Third Symphony was shattered with the era opened up after 9-1-1. The age of consensus gave way to the era of war, war of civilization, land invasions of of Muslim countries, terrorism, renewed anti-Semitism, memory and cultural wars, and a complete rejection of Schindler, the Schindler list, saccharine, din mold. In the Arab world, the response to two new Anglo-American wars in Muslim countries in 2001 and 2003 led to resurgent anti-Semitism and the targeting of Jews. Now, I was living in Cairo at the time. And in a kiosk across from my flat in Somali, I was stunned to find the copy, new copies of the Arabic translation of the Protocols of the Elders of Zion available in the same place where I went to buy my International Herald Tribune. And I marveled, I was dismayed that this czarist invention from the turn of the 20th century that had been resurrected by Googles and translated into German would then be translated into Arabic and sold widely on the Arab street. But everywhere after 911, there was little agreement on either the history or the memory of the Holocaust. <clears throat> Nowhere was there a greater range of opinion as in Poland. Well, the entire field of Holocaust studies was being reinvented there, with, in part with the publication of the very short book that you see here, uh, Young Gross's Neighbors, which came out in the year uh, 2000, 2001 in English. Uh, Gross was a history professor teaching at Princeton, Polish Jewish origins, and his work suggested that the Poles had outdone even the Germans in their, the zeal with which they killed Jews in, in Rooms and, and mass, mass shootings in 1941. And um, his, uh, his thesis showed that the Poles were enthusiastic uh, mass murders and that they didn't hold back. Um, well, I can't impress on you how, how this thesis overturned grainy assumptions that, about who was responsible for the crimes of the Holocaust. But the subsequent power, uh, rise to power of the right-wing nationalist law and order party in Poland. They uh, forbade any declaration of Polish complicity in the Holocaust. Uh, yet Poland's response was not unique. Similar process unfolded at the same time in Lithuania and elsewhere. When a group of French scholars in February 2019 decided to hold a conference to show solidarity with their there with Polish historians, this conference was interrupted by violent anti-Semitic demonstrations. You see a picture of these here. Mostly women, Polish women coming to decry the uh, um, uh, uh, what Gross and other scholars had done to the reputation of Poland. Well, meanwhile, at the same moment, the French government hurled itself into a diametrically opposed position. Uh, regarding the revelations of collaboration. 
Now, far from discouraging such findings, in 2016, we see a picture here of, of the, the ceremony. The uh, President Macron made a statement that a generation earlier would have been unthinkable, marking the anniversary of the 1942 Belle d'Hiver roundup when 13,000 French uh, and foreign Jews living in France were deported and exterminated at Auschwitz. Auschwitz. The president asserted that this was a French action, entirely French. He underlined, pas un seul allemand, not a single German was mobilized for this action. And in this highly emotional speech, he even spoke of, of France's love for the murdered Jewish children. Even Spain got involved in this uh, maelstrom. Spain, of all countries, which the Celts Jews in the 15th century in action. In, in 2015, uh, Spanish law uh, uh, was passed that allowed for Sephardic Jews to apply for citizenship to Spain. Uh, and no one who witnessed the public pronouncements of that time could not be moved. Uh, the, the Spanish uh, official announcing this said, Quantos os echamos de menos? How we've missed you. Come back. Well, a, a uh, clear manifestation of the history and the memory wars of the last 20 years has been the debate over the creation of memorials, but also uh, how far visits to the sites can play a key role in, in, in pedagogy. Uh, today, you could spend months just traveling around the continent visiting memorials or, or sites of mass shootings and extermination. I want to mention some of these, um, uh, just a few of these, these memorial sites that I think are, are, are worthy of, of uh, our attention. And, um, uh, um, one of these is called the Skipping Stones, the Stolpersteine. There are some 80,000 of these little engraved cobblestones all over Europe and even further afield. It is a sign, perhaps, of the homo homogeneity of Holocaust memorials. And yet, at the same time, we can't deny that it is a, a <clears throat> powerful expression since the decision to lay one of these stones for a person who had been exterminated usually emerges from a school, young people research where Holocaust victims were killed, uh, or rather where they lived. Uh, often the residents of the apartment will learn that they have someone in their building who was exterminated, and they come together and they create the, the, uh, the ceremony and they apply for permits and all of that. And um, I, I find it to be a, a, a very a moving kind of tribute the Stropperstein. Another memorial that I think is apropos, it's not actually about the Holocaust, but I thought I'd mention it because for me, it, it really uh, suggests an appropriate way to remember the loss, not only of the six million, but of an entire culture, a language, a rich, rich traditions that was obliterated and will never come back. And that is the this memorial in Berlin that remembers the book burning, uh, the spectacle that took place in April 1933 after Hitler had come to power. A book burning event that was initiated by the Nazis, but mostly overseen by the students and professors of the university. And today you can see a memorial that is a sunken, empty library, empty shelves. And for me, I think this really captures a sense of the, the whole that is in Europe, at the center of Europe, uh, how, uh, that, uh, that, that was the, this flourishing culture that is now a, a metaphorical whole for all of us. And then there's one other memorial that I'll mention, and that's in Vienna. You might have seen this, the Juden, uh, the Judenplatz. And again, the theme, the, 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 the metaphor is the book, the book. And in this case, the, it's, a, it's a concrete uh, monolith and the books are all facing in, so you can't see the, the spine and the title of the book. All you see are the edges. A sense of the lost, lost uh, civilization. But more interesting, perhaps, at the same memorial, that all around the memorial, you see the places 
where it had 65,000 exterminated Austrian Jews were taken to be killed. And what you realize looking at these place names is that so much of Europe is implicated in this senseless extermination. So we see that Austrian Jews were taken to German sites like Ravensbrück and Berger Belsen, Auschwitz and Treblinka in Poland, uh, Mali Trostanets in Belarus, Mauthausen in Austria, others too, sites in Latvia, in Italy, Slovakia. And there's a sense in this memorial, I, I think, of a double of a double tragedy, a double loss. First of all, the lost souls who were who wanted to live, who were who were wiped out along with an entire gene pool of a civilization, one of the a key nexus of European culture. Uh, people whose life stories would never be written. That's one loss. But with these place names, the implication of the whole continent, we also see the 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 loss of Gentile Europe, of their soul, for having been a part of this extermination, uh, something they will never get over, the guilt and the shame. Then there's also the visits to the sites. And um, I've taken student groups to Auschwitz from, from Queens. The problem taking students there or going yourself is not so much uh, preparing your, your, the student for what they will see, but what they won't see. For example, you won't have any sense if you visit the, the, the block of latrines that these would never have been so pristine and, and clean and odor free as they are now. You walk around the Auschwitz Birkenau outside, and everywhere you see grass growing. Well, there was no grass growing during the war. The, the arriving Jews ate every blade of grass, the bark off the trees, leaves off the off the trees. They were so hungry and thirsty. The vegetation has restored itself over the years, of course. And one of the remarkable things you notice is that exactly where the bones were crushed, where the ashes were scattered, there little white flowers grow in the spring. There are a couple aspects of the visit that are unforgettable. The first is at Birkenau. I always do it in the reverse order. I go to Birkenau, where the scale of the place will stay with you forever. If you visited enormous squares in other parts of Europe, maybe Palace Square and St. Petersburg, and you walk onto it and you're taken aback, and you, you can imagine the power of the czars. But Birkenau is another level entirely. You don't feel small, you feel non existent. And the other thing that I take away from the visit is in the museum, the Auschwitz Museum. And there, uh, what strikes us are these rooms full of eyeglasses, and shoes, and artificial hair. And you go from one room to another, and it's again, it's the scale and the size of these rooms full of the last possessions of the you know, deportees who uh, arrived there. And um, we begin to, to understand in these rooms that the Holocaust, when we talk about the Holocaust being industrial, we don't simply mean that it was mass murder by an advanced Western industrial country. No, no, no. What we mean is that for Germans, Jews were an industry. You could take away their homes and their bicycles and their radios and their art and their furniture and their the children's toys and their suitcases and their cups and their saucers and their eyeglasses and their the long braids on the girls. You could take all that away. And you could harvest them. They were an industry with only a few byproducts, some ashes, bits of bone, and a poof of smoke. Well, we're on the cusp of a new era now. <clears throat> the memory of the Holocaust and the way that history of the Holocaust will be told is uh, undergoing vast changes during this decade. In my view, three things are likely to happen. First of all, <clears throat> new 
technological digital techniques will revolutionize, democratize deep research and knowledge and make available data, especially photographs that uh, will permit new explorations of subfields of the Holocaust that we can barely imagine. Um, for example, this initiative that spanned the uh, many European states and scholars that created a digital database of, of shared uh, images. It will also be an era when a new witness is born, and that witness will be the earth. What is buried, what is buried, and what will be uncovered. The instinct of the Nazis was to cover up their crime, to, well, they, they blew up the, the crematoria and the gas chambers, and they, they uh, buried or burned all the bodies. But um, the, the, the instinct that comes, uh, that, that the Nazis, uh, uh, the ins their instinct was to destroy the evidence of the crime by burying it. Bury but in fact, the crimes, the evidence of the crimes remains underground. The ground is going to speak to us. It will, un 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 it will reveal secrets, reveal its secrets. And already at uncounted sites of mass murder across the you know, Eastern Europe, the, the, um, uh, these camps are now vast archaeological digs. Well, the third thing that will happen inevitably, as I mentioned at the beginning, was is that the age of the eyewitness will end. And in its place, you will, you will have the age of the witness to the witness. That is, those who once met, interviewed, or knew Holocaust survivors, they will become, become valuable sources of transmission. But who will write the, and here we see finally, uh, Jeanette Malinka, one of the last active Holocaust survivors who is meeting every week with several classrooms of French students and taking them to uh, Auschwitz, uh, born in 1925. But uh, to return to the opening of the talk, uh, where I referred to Walter Benjamin, he said that historians must speak for the dead. The question is, who will write the books? Who will teach the Holocaust? Who will, will be willing to absorb the psychic damage that comes from studying the extermination? Well, I can tell you, someone who teaches the subject, that each year I get older, but my students remain the same age. And they grow in number. This year I'm teaching the Holocaust to about 150 young people. And on the first day of class, we just started actually this week on Tuesday, and I, there they were. And I just, uh, I wonder how it is that we found each other. Who are they? And the answer may lie in the nebulous realm of Jewish mysticism. A medieval Talmudic tradition tells us that before she is born, the soul, the new soul, is taught the history of the world, including all of the collective uh, tribulations and all the collective pain of humanity. And we might compare this to uh, Carl Jung's idea of the collective uh, uh, unconscious, thus collectivus unbelustus. But since babies shouldn't be born with the accumulated weight of the world on their tiny shoulders. Jewish mysticism tells us that an angel of forgetting is sent down to earth. And at their birth, the angel of forgetting kisses each newborn baby on the upper lip right here. Did you ever wonder why you can't remember something when you put your finger here? Ah, but the angel of forgetting is herself very forgetful. The angel of forgetting forgets to kiss some babies. She doesn't wipe away their memories. And they will remember everything. And they will tell our stories.
know they don't all the time, but if, um, if anyone has a um, question or it's always uh, looking afterwards as well. Um, sir? I'm very, always very, very What is happening? What has happened? What did happen in the North of Ireland? You know, politically. And 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 he will be like the leaders of the other side. So much. Uh, I, I, you know, I'm like a lot of people. I'm a little tired of the, the format and also the voice of uh, his narrator. Um, yeah, uh, but um, but no, excellent. Well, maybe his best, his best uh, since the Civil War. Mm. Uh, yes, sir. Thank you for a very thoughtful and moving lecture and a very generous. Thank you for attending. You're asking me how we can use the example of the Holocaust to uh, prevent or to prevent forgetting about other events? Well, it's, I mean, the, 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 you know, when I was in junior high, the history teacher had this quote on his desk uh, that those who cannot remember the past are, returned, are condemned to repeat it. And I always thought it was totally idiotic thing to tell young people. Um, uh, I like to tell my students that those who remember Santa Yana's adage are condemned to repeat it. Um, the best we can do is say never again today. Never again today. And I think that's the spirit of many of my students who show up in class. They understand that genocide is something that was repeated after the Holocaust and something that preceded it. And, one of the things I didn't mention in the talk is that the result of the last 80 years of research and also the trajectory of the human experience is that the, 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 there's no uniqueness to the, the, um, the Holocaust. And, and genocide is not like a, it's not like a serpent slithering through time that occasionally rears its head. It's part of humanity. And, and so, um, what the role of the historian is in, in, in uh, forestalling future events. I, I think it, it may be a mistake to ask teachers of history to, to run after all of the, the latest uh, crises and, and play the role of, of, uh, of policymakers or, or, um, or, or statesmen. But um, certainly discussing events that were long repressed 
sends a powerful message to those who commit crimes again. And doing the research, the archaeological digs, uh, it also sends the message that you, you, the mass graves, that's not an answer either. We will dig them up and we will discover who is responsible. Yes, sir. Um, I wonder if you could say something about uh, what many people consider to be the uh, exploitation of the Holocaust in books such as uh, you know, uh, Mass Fiction, uh, Taylor of Auschwitz, and Musician of Auschwitz, mm -hmm. or even perhaps the Memorial to Strike the Jams. Yeah. Right. Well, um, you know, there's a there's an art, a chapter that I assigned to my students, and it's called There's No Business Like Show Up Business. And it's about the topic you're mentioning about the the exploitation of suffering and the, the, the commercialization of the Holocaust. Uh, most of the students I teach nowadays, they will have had their first exposure to the Holocaust through this last book you mentioned, The Boy with the Striped Pajamas. That is a work of fiction and an absurd one because it suggests that there were German, there, there could have been German or Jewish child playing on the perimeter of the camp. In fact, one of the reasons the Holocaust was a rupture in civilization was because of the hunting of Jewish children. When you arrived at the ramp at Auschwitz-Birkenau, there were kapos who would approach you. And if you were there with your family, if you had children with you, the kapo would tell you, give the hand of your child to an old person. And if you didn't do it immediately, they would say, I'm only going to tell you one more time. Give the hand of your child to an old person. The children, the old people would be gagged. You had, as a parent, just a few moments to abandon your child, or you were dead. The, this novel, um, it seems to have entered the curriculum in Northern Ireland and in in uh, England, uh, from that's a kind of unscientific poll. But those kinds of uh, mass produced popular novels, they do a lot of damage to uh, distort uh, basic uh, elements of, uh, of the history of the show. Yes. Why do you think Holocaust is so much about the Holocaust? Uh, well, um, uh, I mean, to be, uh, if I wanted to be extremely charitable, I would say that Holocaust denial is a kind of reflexive reaction to uh, uh, any kind of detailed exploration of the topic. I mean, I, I started life as a Holocaust denier to a certain extent in that attending a Jewish summer camp in Oregon in 19. 75, 1974, as an eight or nine year old, we were given you know, instructions. We played games where we had to hide in basements so that the Nazis would catch us. And um, we, were, we were in denial, certainly. Um, and it, only, it was only meeting some survivors, for example, at a bar next to New York in 1976, or talking to my grandfather in Chicago learning that his cousins had been killed in the Planary Forest outside of Vilna in Lithuania, uh, that these things gradually sank in. So on the one hand, it, it's, um, it's, it's a real challenge uh, to, to accept the, uh, the, um, the, the, the cruelty that was the Holocaust. Of course, there's, a, there's also a group of people who are continuing the work of the Nazis and covering up the crime. And, the denial of the Holocaust is, I would say, a continuation not only of the uh, devious nature of, of the, the use of the euphemisms and the dynamiting of gas chambers the Nazis undertook at the end of the war, but more to the point, it also is a continuation of anti Semitic propaganda, for example, the, the, uh, the protocols of the elders of Zion. The, 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 the Holocaust for the deniers, the Holocaust just becomes another Jewish conspiracy. 
Uh, it's uh, and um, of course, then the root of the Jewish conspiracy to invent the Holocaust is to extract money and advantage. Uh, so it ties in with medieval, medieval um, sources of anti-Semitic or anti-Judaism -Jew that are based upon certain commercial ideas. So these, I think these things are all, all connected. However, I mentioned near the end of the talk that the, the Kiel panel has undergone um, the digital revolutions, and the result of that is, is that the the, the evidence, the, the docu documentary evidence of the Holocaust is so overwhelming that at this stage, uh, I would um, uh, I would let them make their case, and you will see how weak the case it is that it never took place. Well, thank you very much for attending. I'll be around if you want to talk to me. Afterwards.